So I think the way we like to do this is then um, have each of the um, our uh, individuals from the public come up and, and give their statement, and then we'll, at, after that, open it up for a further discussion. Um, and the um, time slot is um, relatively short. Um, you have five minutes for making your public comment. So I'll stand up when the five minutes is done, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, our first uh, comment is from Tim King, um, who uh, represents Legionella Risk Management. Oh. Thank you, Tim. So, um, sometimes when I get a project, I'm asked to uh, submit a CV. And when I do, it uh, shows that I'm a marine engineer. I worked as a subsea engineer on oil rigs, a project engineer on ship construction, a facilities engineering manager, and a water treatment consultant. And I frequently get asked, how did you get into Legionella? So here's the long answer. In May of 2005, there were two simultaneous outbreaks, one in Rapid City, South Dakota, and one in Sarpsborg, Norway. In both of those outbreaks, the first place visited by public health, microbiologists, epidemiologists, et cetera, was the cause of the outbreak. In both of those outbreaks, nobody collected a water sample because the people inspecting it said there's no way this could cause an outbreak. One was a huge heat rejection pond at a pulp mill, and the other one was an ornamental fountain in a Mexican restaurant with three submerged 150 watt incandescent lights. <clears throat> This failure prolonged the outbreak in Sharpsburg by several weeks and in Rapid City by several months. Laura mentioned there's challenges in assessment capacity. I think that's the nicest euphemism I've ever heard for total levels of incompetence with people that don't know what they're looking at. And this problem is pervasive in public health and in engineering. So we have issues of waterborne pathogens, but limited understanding of what causes it and how it's transmitted. Jason mentioned there's very little association with waterborne pathogens and municipal water. In 2012, in an AWWA conference, I gave a presentation on four outbreaks I personally investigated that were caused by municipal water events. So there definitely is, but if the person doing the investigation doesn't know what they're looking for, they're never going to find it. At an Ohio Department of Health meeting, I said the first thing the task force should do is address the issue caused by the person sitting next to me, which was the Ohio EPA person. I said they have policies in place that make it very difficult for building owners to treat Legionella. The response was, we're not responsible for public health. We're responsible for EPA code enforcement. Everybody in the room, their jaws dropped to the floor. Still today, this is a huge problem in Ohio, which has some of the highest rates per capita of Legionella in the United States. I've spoken at the EPA meetings and let them know about this problem. The primary agencies, primacy agencies, um, Ohio EPA and PADEP, and the issues with the Safe Drinking Water Act that I mentioned. Unfortunately, it appears that can't be changed. Then there's Flint, <clears throat> the Genesee Health Department headed up that investigation because of home rule. In the state of Michigan, the local county is in charge. And it seems as though uh, the people in charge have the least amount of competence. So we had a two year outbreak because the people in charge of investigating the outbreak had very low level of confidence, or as Laura would say, challenges in assessment capacity. In the state of Michigan, they probably won't write a paper on the errors of giving a huge research project to an in-state institution rather than an academic institution that has subject matter expertise. That's another issue that we have. By far the worst failure of public health and government is the 2012 VA Pittsburgh outbreak. As a result of this investigation failure, 
the VA developed a guideline, the 2014 guideline Ole mentioned, which to me is one of the worst guidelines out there, and replaced the 2009 document, which to me was the most cost-effective Legionella policy in the world by far. The 2009 document required hospitals maintain hot water between 120 and 130 at every fixture and 140 at the hot water heater. What the VA Pittsburgh was doing, which never came out in the uh, OIG review, was they were following the policy halfway. They were maintaining 140 in all their hot water heaters at the time prior to the outbreak. What they didn't do is put in master mixing valves. So they were delivering 140 to their sinks and showers. Utterly insane. So what did they do? They took their hot water heaters that were poorly maintained and dropped the temperature down to 110. And then they had an outbreak within years following that. That never came out in the investigation. So the VA changed the policy because of what happened there. As a result of that, <clears throat> people from the VA in Pittsburgh presented at HACCP conferences, sales and marketing conferences, and along with them, people from EPA and CDC presented at these HACCP sales and marketing conferences. And now NSF International is leading a HACCP program which people think maybe is a solution. And in fact, the committee chair of that HACCP program is Matt Arduino from NSF International, or from CDC, I'm sorry. I think people need to look at the problems that have been involved in policy and understanding and take a break before they make a decision of following something that is expensive. The 2009, for instance, guideline from VA was cheap, effective work. I audited three VA hospitals during that time period, asked infection control, how many cases of scolding did you have? And they actually had scolding cases on record from microwaves and coffee, which is exactly what CDC found in their study in 2012. So some common sense, some looking across the borders. I think we can reach consensus, but I think people need to look at some of the baselines that these policies are developed upon. Thank you. Uh, our next um, public speaker will be uh, Darren Klein from the Alliance to Prevent Legionnaires Disease. Thank you, Darren. Good afternoon. My name is Darren Klein with the Alliance to Prevent Legionnaires' Disease. The Alliance is a nonprofit health organization advocating for a comprehensive approach to disease prevention. On behalf of the Alliance, I'd like to thank the National Academy of Sciences for taking on this tremendous initiative and all of you for committing your time and expertise to advancing the discussion about how we can minimize Legionella bacteria from source to consumption. I want to welcome and echo many points we've heard today many that are in line with the Alliance mission, which is to reduce the occurrence of Legionnaires' disease by promoting public research and education, and to help implement best practices and policy for its prevention. We urge the committee to frame the Legionella challenge, and your statement uh, of task suggests a systemic one that addresses waterborne bacterial risk throughout the water distribution system. We are concerned that there has been insufficient focus on what can be done to reduce the risk of Legionella bacteria going into buildings and homes from the public water supply. The Alliance would like the committee to consider the following studies. An EPA study discovered Legionella in 67% of water storage tank sediments. Legionella pneumophila was in 33% of them, and Legionella pneumophila serum group one was in 28% of the drinking water supply tanks. Another EPA study on tap water, 47% of were positive for Legionella pneumophila serum group one in at least one sampling event, and 27% of samples were positive for Legionella pneumophila DNA. 20% of samples were positive for Legionella pneumophila serum group one. And not surprisingly, the recent CDC study on equipment supplied with potable drinking water released last December found Legionella DNA isolated from 40% of the equipment, Legionella pneumophila isolated from 27%, and Legionella pneumophila serum group one was isolated from 20% of the equipment. So you see the pattern. Legionella and its species at various concentrations are in our drinking water distribution system, outside and inside the building. 
No more studies are required at the expense of the taxpayer to find out where it is, how much, and what type. Let's find a solution, let's all share the responsibility, and stop passing all the responsibility costs on the building owners who, are, who cannot uh, be expected to fully handle the task, especially when there are factors and variables outside of their control. Therefore, the Alliance would like to see the committee address the following issues and answer these questions. For the CDC, given that 96% of LD cases are individual and sporadic, how important is environmental investigation of sporadic cases and gaining understanding of the disease? Uh, on intrusion of Legionella, what impact does distribution system water quality, including Legionella growth in the biofilm, have on LD rates? To what degree do events like water main breaks, other pressure loss events, flooding or construction impact the increased intrusion of Legionella bacteria into buildings and homes? Bacterial pneumonia and aspiration, what are the risks associated with drinking water that contains any level of Legionella bacteria? The American Lung Association states that bacterial pneumonia, including Legionella, can live in healthy throats, multiply, and work their way down into the lungs. And maybe the Sloan Foundation uh, could fund this study. The EPA on filtration, is Legionnaire's disease considered a waterborne disease? What level of waterborne bacteria, including Legionella, is acceptable to the EPA for municipalities that seek a filtration waiver? Given the findings and recent studies which link water source to increased levels of Legionella, does the EPA recommend water filtration for water treatment plants that service areas with high rates of Legionnaire disease, like New York City, which does not filter its water, but has the highest LD rates in the nation. And just some general statements. Data on exposure source is drawn almost exclusively from outbreaks. The aspiration route of transmission, if included at all, is an afterthought. The specifics of human exposure are poorly understood. Infectious dose level is completely unknown. Test methods are not consistent, accurate, culture versus PCR. An overarching recommendation we would make to the committee is to put proper attention on sporadic cases of Legionnaire's disease. Too often, because of political pressures, outbreaks drive rushed public health policy decisions. The publication this week of the Flint study drives home the point that more research, monitoring, and ultimately investments are needed for source and distribution water in order to lower waterborne disease rates. We are not prescriptive in what the optimal solutions might be and look forward to ideas the committee develops. Finally, we recognize and support ongoing efforts to implement effective water management plans for premise plumbing. Many of our members actively participate in the ASHRAE 198 committee and review the CDC water management toolkit. And we happily offer our expertise to this committee. Thank you. My timer was just about to go off there. Perfect timing. Um, our next uh, public presenter will be uh, Joe Cotruvo from NSF International. Well, I'm on contract to NSF. I don't work for NSF, actually. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, express my appreciation to the Academy, to Laura, uh, for the opportunity to say a few words here. And I'd like to say that it's uh, very timely and uh, certainly appropriate and will contribute to improve public health in relating to uh, regrowth in distribution systems and plumbing. Um, I'm gonna say just a couple of things, uh, a few comments about the activity that the Academy will be engaging in, and also a few comments about a uh, symposium that we have coming up in May in Baltimore. About half of the people on the committee are participants and speakers, and maybe half of the people in the room are, are, are gonna be there, and I hope the rest of you will too. Uh, I, I can tell you this, it's, uh, it's been long in gestation, but it finally got here, partially supported by the National um, Academy of Sciences, and um, the, the, it's going to be a very comprehensive symposium. Its, act, uh, its goal is to provide information that people who are engaged uh, can use to make decisions. And the simple bottom line goal is save lives. It's very clear that uh, all you have to do is look at the uh, CDC uh, drinking water disease outbreak uh, MMWRs for the last six years, I think, at least. Uh, several major points. Uh, number one, the 
total number of waterborne diseases are in decline, have been in decline, outbreaks have been in decline for about 30 years now, since the implementation of the Safe Drinking Water Act, by the way. Uh, secondly, most of the diseases that occur now are due to what happens to the water after it leaves the plant, in the distribution, in the plumbing. And as far as other diseases like cholera, typhoid, well, forget about those. <laughs> I mean, they just are not real time in the United States and others. But legionellosis accounts for two thirds of the disease outbreaks that they report on. That's two thirds. Uh, one or two crypto sporadia, one or two norovirus. But it's very clear that the, the most significant drinking water public health issue in the United States is legionellosis, period. And then add on a few others of other microorganisms that are also regrowth microorganism distribution. The second most important issue, of course, is, is infrastructure. And there's a linkage here because of deteriorating infrastructure. Um, and so it's, um, it's, it's a no-brainer. <laughs> you know, let's do something. And uh, I think there are a number of things that can be done. Um, number one, I, I do, as I pointed out in one of the comments, EPA does have some limitations on their regulatory authority past the meter. But that does not mean that they have limitations on their ability to influence agencies and organizations, be they hospitals, buildings, be they states or communities, to influence and advise them on the appropriate actions that they can and should take to reduce risk. So, uh, I, I wrote a paper on this kind of thing a few years ago, and I'll leave it for the record. Uh, it points out a number of possibilities that EPA could apply. And one of them, which is really simple and quick, is just don't place any restrictions on what people do to their hot water side. Because hot water is not in the Drinking Water Act. That word is not mentioned in the Safe Drinking Water is not mentioned in any regulations. There's no monitoring, there's no compliance that has anything to do with hot water. So it'd be very simple for EPA to just say, as a guidance, we're gonna just exempt, you should exempt anything where treatment is only being applied to hot water. Simple, quick, uncontroversial, I think, beneficial, because a lot of, of facilities just treat hot water. So, um, I think I would say uh, that um, legionellosis might be kind of the prime illustration of the law of unanticipated, uh, unanticipated consequences. It's a situation, obviously, that's very focused on developed countries, developed environments. It may well be, as I said, the most significant waterborne disease issue in the United States. It may well be worldwide in developed countries that have plumbing. And so it's a major issue. I think there are great opportunities here in the committee uh, del deliberations and recommendations to change the environment on this matter. And I think our uh, symposium coming up in May in Baltimore, which I invite you all to, uh, will also be a great opportunity to improve the level of knowledge and information and perhaps some guidance that people can use to reduce the risk. So, uh, and by the way, I do have registration forms with me if you'd like to sign up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Very good. Um, our next uh, presenter will be Brad Considine, uh, also from the Alliance uh, to Prevent Legionnaires' Disease. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, I also want to add my uh, appreciation for the effort that the committee is putting into addressing this challenge uh, and offer some perspectives based on some of our experience over the uh, several decades since this disease was first uh, identified uh, with the outbreak in Philadelphia. Uh, and I think what's really important, what we would like to emphasize is how important it is 
that we frame this problem properly. I think that can be one of the uh, most significant steps uh, for the committee. Uh, and one of the greatest contributions you can make to the reduction and elimination of this disease. Uh, so from our experience, the failure to properly define the problem has greatly limited our success in addressing this disease over 42 years. And unfortunately, some of the narrow perspectives that were formed in the beginning uh, have led to Band-Aid style solutions, sometimes driven by a variety of interests that aren't always anchored around uh, addressing the, the real threat, the public health threat of Legionella. We firmly believe that the problem needs to be defined as a systemic issue that recognizes that Legionella bacteria exists in the environment, comes through our source water, establishes itself in the biofilm that coats our public water storage and distribution systems, is released into the water system by disruptions such as floods, main breaks, source water changes, construction, water flow changes, and then comes into our homes and buildings and ultimately gets human exposure through drinking, showering, cooking, water features, misters, hot tubs, and other building equipment. Legionella is the byproduct of a substantial ecosystem that travels for miles that we believe repeatedly seeds Legionella colonies downstream. This is the problem that we face and how it must be defined if we were to arrive at meaningful solutions. Darren covered the number of studies that are increasingly showing the uh, impact of uh, the system level issues. Uh, but conversely, building our equipment only solutions have shown little to no improvements in the rate of disease, not significantly in Europe and definitely not in New York City where they experienced a 65% increase over last year, exceeding their outbreak here in 2015. Nearly three years of regulations and no improvement. Now we have the VA home example in Quincy, Illinois, which invested millions of dollars in some of the most advanced building control systems in the world. And three years later, people are getting sick and dying from Legionnaire's disease. We believe the governor of Illinois is correct in exploring the water distribution system and the potential relationship to source water from the Mississippi. In fact, preliminary assessments of Legionnaire rates appear higher around the Great Lakes and other natural water sources. A study out of Connecticut is also showing the relationship. Plus, we have encountered numerous community outbreaks where the epidemiology studies failed to assess changes in the water system. For example, in 2016 in Hopkins, uh, Minnesota, detection, we think detection bias drove the health department to limited sampling of building equipment. They failed to evaluate changes in the water system. If they had, they would have discovered the following. The city of Hopkins had multiple floods that summer prior to the outbreak. They were undergoing major repair of the sewer systems, were refurbishing and recoding two, two water towers, and they have natural occurring ammonia in the water system, a nutrient for Legionella. Ultimately, the public health department points to a single piece of equipment at a business, reportedly with low CFU counts. The health department would have you believe that this affected people for five miles. Ultimately, a lawsuit filed by a man who worked at the near door, uh, next door car dealership car wash, virtually inundated with water mist daily. And this story is not unusual as we see chronic failures to properly assess environmental factors. Now, these are some of the recent uh, outbreak cases, which brings up another uh, great perspective that's been called out today. And that's that the CD, you know, the CDC highlights that uh, four percent of these cases are outbreak, uh, ninety-six percent are individual sporadic that may be related uh, to the outbreaks. But again, the focus has been on outbreaks, and most of our policies are defined by outbreaks, uh, even though the greatest number is individual and sporadic. So our policies are being developed and implemented under the stress and public pressure of an outbreak while the majority of people affected are not involved in an outbreak. This single fact has done perhaps the most damage in, in confusing the discussion about Legionella and has entrapped us in solutions that are overweighted toward outbreaks, leading to an overemphasis on complex buildings. At times, the policies seem more designed to get the health department and the public officials off the hook during an intense health crisis. However, there are 25 times more cases that are individual and sporadic. Tragic and compelling cases like four-year-old Muriel Block from Missouri, whose family brought her to one of the world's greatest cancer treatment centers 
Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital. And they took the extra step of getting her into an apartment in Manhattan to recover, taking no chances of getting exposure to others while she was immune compromised. The family never dreamt that her greatest risk would be right in the shower head where they bathed her, but it was. She contracted Legionnaire's disease, had several surgeries and ultimately died. Or James Rouse, a healthy teacher in the Bronx who contracted the disease and died about 60 days before the large outbreak in the Bronx. Or Kevin Hanlon, a treatable cancer patient who contracted Legionnaires in New York last year and passed away. No headlines, no nightly news, just tragedy. Sadly, these stories go on and on. That is why your work here is so important. You have a chance to make a huge difference in many, many people's lives. We applaud you, we support you, and we will be with you to accomplish the great mission every step of the way. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Our um, next um, individual for public comment is Steve Via from the American Water Works Association. Thank you. Afternoon. Uh, I'm Steve Vi. I'm with the American Water Works Association. Uh, as with the other speakers, thanks very much to the panel for convening and, and for the funders and for the, for the academy for organizing this panel. It's timely and important. Uh, for your benefit as well as mine, I'm going to read a prepared statement. Uh, <laughs> As work uh, by the members of this panel have, has shown, the challenges before us uh, is how to most effectively, one, prevent the pr proliferation of Legionella within building plumbing and mechanical systems, and two, to reduce the aerosolization of Legionella through building systems in a way that exposes individuals. In this context, when I say Legionella for simplification, I'm thinking Legionella pneumophila, and in particular, serotype 1. So to achieve those two goals, what we, what we have before us is a need to have appropriate engineering, design, and operation of building mechanical systems and water features, particularly in facilities like medical campuses and nursing homes, the maintenance of water quality and plumbing systems throughout buildings, which can particularly be challenging in large buildings and hot water systems, the consideration of the impact, positive and negative, of on-premise treatment systems, to conditions that affect the proliferation of Legionella and managing conditions in community water systems to control factors that contribute to conditions in plumbing systems that promote the proliferation of Legionella. It's clear there are opportunities to learn from instances where outbreaks have illustrated how building and distribution system infrastructure have contributed to Legionella exposure at levels of concern. While outbreaks are a subset of the disease in the community, they are instances that could have studied point the way to measures that are significant in controlling endemic disease. If the panel could identify those key lessons learned from outbreaks that we can use in the near term to better manage Legionella, it'd be very informative. Uh, we know that the current regulations require disinfection for Legionella, where Legionella is likely to be present as, in a source of supply. We also know that all surface water systems and many groundwater systems maintain a secondary disinfectant residual, as well as actively maintaining the distribution system mains and flushing finished water storage. But at present, there's not a significant body of science to inform decisions about community water system treatment and distribution system practices. This panel could identify the research needed to understand how the distributed water from local community water systems influence the occurrence of Legionella and premise plumbing relative to the other, fact, other factors. For instance, at present, while there is a general recognition that the above practices are important and that drinking water is not sterile, it's not clear what practices or target levels of Legionella and distribution systems warrant focused attention. As a practical matter, the lack of understanding by regulators, building owners and operators, and water systems around the risk or lack thereof of low concentrations of Legionella limits efforts to better manage Legionella exposure. Simply saying that any Legionella and distribution systems is a risk without quantifying or bounding will misdirect resources 
and potentially increase other risk, such as disinfection byproducts. If the panel could provide a path forward to overcoming this barrier to improving Legionella risk management, it would be very useful. Also, it's not clear how to best foster information exchange between community water systems, state regulators, and building owner operators on the topic of Legionnaire's disease. It appears that there are significant opportunities for risk reduction if water systems and building owner operators effectively exchanged information, but this exchange is difficult to establish. If the panel could identify key data needs and strategies to foster communication, it'd be helpful. Thank you for your time and attention. Be glad to try and address any questions. Thanks very much. Um, are there any other public comments at this time? So I think we could open it up for discussion. Um, I'd like to see if the committee members have any comments or questions or summaries that they'd like to, statements they'd like to perhaps provide at this point. Lauren's going to give us some. This isn't really a, a question. I was just going to ask if Darren could um, give us the, the many citations he included in his comments, some of which we have, some of which we don't. Some of the, the EPA studies? Uh, any of the citations. Yeah, yeah I, I yeah, made I a note of all of them. I'll submit that. I have it. And I also wanted to just ask if um, all four of the first speakers who uh, did not provide us with a written statement, if, if you're willing to um, provide us your comments in writing, in addition to what you said to us, I think that'd be most helpful for the committee's record. Some of the things I think we would like to go back and consider in more depth, and that's hard to do unless we've got a written version. I think that, you know, one of the points I came across to me was that what are the lessons learned from both outbreaks on uh, looking at depth at various outbreaks and um, trying to understand more of these sporadic cases and what that means. And CDC's data already that says showers and taps um, are uh, associated with disease, um, but we and we have some data on concentrations, and then the issue is some of the ecology and transmission. So that's something that um, occurred to me as as the speakers were, were presenting. All right. Well, um, I just want to say uh, thank you for all for participating. Um, it, you've given us, uh, the committee, a big, uh, <laughs> a very large and big challenge. I think it's complex. I think it's very important. I think all the committee members are uh, feel it's very important mm -hmm. as well and are going to be quite dedicated, I, I believe, to this committee. And um, we're looking forward to uh, moving forward with the work. And we appreciate um, the sponsors. We appreciate the presentations today. We're going to be coming back for data and information, um, and uh, we'll uh, we'll work hard. And I think you'll, this will be a very important report. And Joe, maybe I'll just end with uh, one of the comments you made: uh, very important for public health. So, all right, Laura. Any other last-minute statements from the academies? All right. Well, we're going to officially close the public meeting. And again, thank you for coming. <laughs>